answers you need Are you listening? I'll tell you the truth about God My eyes haven't seen him And his hands have never touched him Why don't we welcome Don Stewart? Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? It's good to see you all again. It's been a guy. It seems like a long time, hasn't it, since we've been together? Uh, yeah, I hope you're pray, praying for uh, Barry. It's um, you know one of these things. I know when you're busy in the ministry, when you're doing what you're doing, he really, really wants to be here with you guys. And I've been get texting him back and forth and hopefully miraculously he'll come back and uh and and be here before you know it but uh you are so blessed you really are to have him i you know count him as like the best friend i have in the world and he's just uh whenever i'm having you know an issue uh something i need some godly wisdom on i'm i want to stress the word godly he's the guy i go to he really is and so you're you're i mean totally blessed to have him here as the pastor so uh Lord bless him. A uh, couple of things. Yeah, we got, actually, there's another book that arrived today, too. I just didn't bring it. Um, I'm, I'm cranking them out pr pretty quickly, as you can probably tell. I, didn't, I haven't written them all in the last few weeks. They were written like 10, 15 years ago. And because of Amazon's print-on-demand, now I'm able to fairly inexpensively get them into print. But I'm reading them over again and redoing them and that. So hopefully you'll, you'll find them edifying and a, a blessing. I'm, I'm enjoying doing it in that. And so uh, number, I think it was a 17 yeah, or 18, that one's coming tomorrow. Oh, it's actually here. I didn't bring it tonight. A um, couple things. Uh, we're on Hebrews chapter 6, if you recall, and we will finish it, believe me. Um, there's so much there. And I know it, there's a lot of content there, particularly the last time I was with you guys. It's, it's very, very full. So what, here's what I've done. Uh, 511 of Hebrews to 612 is one unit, one unit. We'll get through 612 tonight and finish chapter 6 next week. So what I've done, I'm going to make available for anybody who wants a little commentary on everything I've said, and then some will be on a, a, available for anybody that wants it. And we'll get, give it a, a file for it. We'll get it to Benny and any of you want it. Right now, those, that, those verses, the commentary is at, at 42 pages, so it's fairly thorough. But everything you wanted to know that I've said and then some will be there and the documentation of you know, why I come up with what I've come up with. So uh, you can look at that. And hopefully it'll be helpful. It's been fun writing it, fun going through it. There's so much, so much there. And I'm convinced, it's my wife's favorite book in the Bible, and it's becoming mine too. It's just so wonderful, and there's so many great truths. And, you know, um, we'll, we'll move on tonight on, on this, but also just to know that the, the, the content is really, really fabulous there in Hebrews. Again, 511, uh, the author was talking about Melchizedek in verse 10. He wants to describe Melchizedek as a greater priest than the priesthood of Aaron, but first he has to make a digression. And that is simply because his readers aren't there mature. They're not mature enough to take this. They're babes. In fact, he calls them infants, you know, when they should be mature adults. They take milk instead of solid food. And he's basically encouraging them to be brought forward, to be brought on to maturity. And that's his argument in 6.1. So he's talking to believers. You know, so we talked about a couple weeks ago. I believe very strongly he's, these verses, the controversial ones, verses uh, 4 through 8, it's definitely referring to believers. It's not non-Christians. It's not professing Christians. It's not Christians who can lose their salvation, but Christians who can lose their reward, their, their inheritance, as it were, by not being the sort of believer that the Lord would have us to be. And that's the whole theme there, I believe, of here uh, in this section. Plus, it was earlier he talked about, we'll talk about actually that tonight, and so as we go through this, there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, we need to kind of look inside our own soul and consider here. And that is, uh, tonight we'll see, what are, where's our, our, our crop? Is it on uh, the type of ground that bears fruit or that bears the thorns and thistles, as Paul would say to the Corinthians, uh, ready to be burned? So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 7? 
I'm going to read 7 and 8 together here. Chapters, chapter 6, verse 7. And by the way, this is my own translation. Here. It, should, it better look something more or less like what you see in your Bible or what they put up here. If not, then, uh, then I've kind of missed the mark. But it, it should say something fairly similar here. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7, it says, For the land drinks from the rain that often falls upon it and produces vegetation suitable for those, or suitable to those uh, through for whose sake it has been cultivated. It receives blessing from God. However, if it bears thorns and thistles, it is rejected and about to be cursed. Its fate is to be burned. Now, this, these two verses, particularly the last part, have scared a lot of Christians. We figure, you know, if it's talking about Christians, how is my fate going to be burned? We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, here's what the author is doing. He gave a somber warning about those who fall away. It's impossible to renew yourself into repentance while you're in the process of committing apostasy, while you're in the process of, you know, making Christ an open shame. Now, when you stop doing that, then it is possible to, to turn uh, to the Lord. But while you're doing it, while you're crucifying yourselves, the Son of God, and putting him to an open shame, you can't, you know, there's no way you can repent. But once you stop doing that, then repentance is possible. So now he's going to illustrate this. And he gives a somber warning designed to drive the point home. Now, he uses the word ground here. This is important. We could be detectives, right? He uses it only once in these two verses. It's signifying this. He's not talking about two different types of ground. He's talking about the same ground with two possible outcomes. It's kind of, this is us. This is illustrating us as Christians. The ground we have can produce either useful vegetation or thorns and thistles. In other words, the same ground can produce both depending on how, you know, um, how it's cultivated, as it were. So regardless of the outcome, or regardless of the outcome of the ground, the ground has received rain and care needed for growth. In other words, the ground has been taken care of, and so probably here speaks of God's divine care for each of us. You know, it's interesting, even when we're falling away from the Lord, even when we're in sin, even when we're um, not doing what we should be doing, he's still looking after us. Thank the Lord for that. And he's still offering his provision for spiritual growth here in the life of the believer. But if a life is not fruitful, and certainly not, it's not because God hasn't cared about us, it's all our fault. We can't, you know, we can't blame God for that. So the contrast here in these two verses seems to be this, between a faithful believer who is fruitful, who is bearing fruit for the Lord, and an unfaithful believer who didn't produce what they should produce, all right? In the latter case, the loss is not that of eternal life. Please understand that you cannot lose eternal life. If you could, it wouldn't be eternal, right? What kind of life? <laughs> uh, by definition, eternal life isn't for three weeks. It's, it's everlasting. And so uh, it doesn't mean the loss of eternal life. And remember, the mature and immature believer has been the subject. This whole passage, all the way back to chapter 5, verse 11, he's comparing the two. And we need to ask ourselves, which category would I fit in? Am I a mature believer? Am I immature? Am I in between? Which direction am I going? And so basically to sum up the message of this difficult passage, we can say it this way. Christians can go backwards in their spiritual lives and bring shame to Christ. Sad to say. While they're living in sin, they cannot be brought back to repentance and they're in danger of divine chastening. If they persist, the lives will no longer bear lasting fruit, and they will suffer loss. And the loss, again, is loss of reward, not loss of salvation. This is the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. Remember, we talked about this before. We're all going to appear before it, and our works that we've done since we're a Christian are going to be in one or two categories, things that will stand or things that will burn up. And this is the analogy we've got here, same type of thing. Will our, our, our works stand, or will they, will they just go by the wayside and suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ? Now, lest we think, and this is very important, lest we think, that uh, we use grace as an excuse for sin, which we don't. Uh, Hebrews 10.30 reminds us the Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. God doesn't let us as believers get away with sin. He really doesn't. He judges. In fact, we'll get to that in Hebrews chapter 12. He disciplines us because he loves us like a parent disciplines their children. Now, what's interesting here is the deliberate connection between this and the third chapter of Genesis. Hebrews 6.8, a deliberate allusion. In Genesis 3, 17 to 18, Paul, uh, not Paul, the Lord talks about to Adam and Eve, remember what's going to come up now to Adam, work in the ground, thorns and thistles. In other words, now that you've sinned, the ground is going to be very un, un, you know, 
uh, let's say, non-forgiving for you. As, as well, the ground was cursed by God. So the first man, Adam, received a curse for disobedience, as we have the curse here. And this illusion brings to mind the judgment, but the temporal judgment that fell upon the first man's disobedience. Not eternal judgment, the temporal judgment that the ground was cursed. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, we find the same sort of thing. The word curse signifies a temporal judgment. Again, not an everlasting judgment, a temporal discipline upon his people for disobedience. In fact, we see it very clearly in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Remember, Israel's about to enter the promised land. And so God gets them to the border. The, the Deuteronomy means the second law. The law is repeated. So Moses basically gives God's, you know, lays out, here's, here's the covenant I'm making with you. Two things. Number one, if you obey, if you obey my word, you will be blessed. In fact, Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 2 says this, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So, Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 2 says these blessings will overtake you. Then verses 3 to 14, they start listing them. All these things, and this is the same principle as here. God has all these blessings for us if we obey. Okay? Let's remember that, if we obey the blessings. However, we get to verse 15, if we don't obey, we get the curses, right? If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And so then he lists all these temporal judgments, again, judgment in time, not eternal separation, but temporal judgments that would overtake Israel. And Israel's, their history is a combination of both. We see them blessed by God, we see them cursed by God, but the cursing is judgment, a temporal judgment that came upon them. Now, Paul, uh, I say Paul, probably Paul did write this, but the writer of the Hebrews also talks about uh, those, these, these, uh, these crops are there to be rejected or useless. Now, some translations say worthless. You know, it brings forth thorns and thistles, uh, useless or worthless. That doesn't need to imply the loss of eternal life. Paul, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, uses the same Greek word about himself. He says he doesn't want to be a castaway or be disqualified as a result of not disciplining himself. What was he jeopardizing? Was it his eternal salvation? Oh no, it was his reward, his standing before the Lord for all eternity. That's what he was afraid of jeopardizing by not disciplining his body. So the same words used here. So again, it's talking about reward, not about losing eternal life. So the unfruitful ground in Hebrews 6, 8 is useless, implying the offender, and that can be any of us, is unfit and has not gained God's approval. And that person may be in the store for God's discipline and eventual loss of reward. Now, when the author says his fate is to be burned, not thinking of burning in hell. The metaphor of fire in scripture does sometimes refer to hell, but it also is used in the sense in 1 Corinthians 3 of, of judgment on someone's works, refining them. In other words, scrutinizing the judgment of, re, it's a scrutinizing judgment of regenerate Christians in 1 Corinthians 3, some works burn, some stay. You know, in other words, the, the, the gold, silver, precious stones are refined, the wood, hay, the straw is burned away. So fire reveals the quality of the believer work as a prelude again to dispensing the rewards because this is the whole point he's making in Hebrews you're Christians you're moving on now you're going there's going to be a, 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 a heavenly home you have someday when we get there there's going to be a, a dispensing of rewards based on your faithfulness and we don't want you to be caught slacking we don't want you to be behind in this so two things in the context here again suggest the author has the works of believers in mind for one thing in verse 10 in Hebrews 6 he's going to specifically mention them and then you get to verse 12, he says rewards are in view when he speaks of those who inherit the promises because of their faith and perseverance. Inherit the promises because of faith and perseverance. You don't get the promises of God, uh, you know, salvation by faith and perseverance. You get the promises of God by God's grace through faith, by believing, and then you're saved. Rewards, what comes afterwards is your perseverance, and you earn those. You can't earn your salvation. Uh, you can't, you know, you don't save yourself, you don't keep yourself saved. All right, now he's going to, after saying all these things, and, it, you know, it's kind of a head slap to all these uh, readers and listeners at this time, he's going to change his tune a little bit. Now, look, listen to what he says. As we know, he's talking to believers. However, beloved, we are expecting better things in your case, and it is in this manner that we are speaking the things concerning salvation. 
All right, the last four verses of this unit now we're going to look at are going to be uh, words of encouragement to the readers. He's kind of beating them up a bit, but now he's going to show his concern for them. And apparently he doesn't feel they've gone to this extreme yet of falling away or committing apostasy, as we saw in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. And so he's going to end on an encouraging note. Now, this next point I'm going to make is extremely important, and many Christians, fortunately many Christian teachers make this mistake, the use of the word salvation. All right. Most likely here, salvation is used in the same sense it's used earlier in the letter to the Hebrews, earlier in this book, and it's going to be used later in Hebrews 9.28. It's going to be the salvation that occurs with the events surrounding the coming of Christ to the earth when he returns. The author is thinking of the time when all humans will be crowned with glory and honor in the resurrected state, ruling with Christ. That's the salvation he's referring to, because as we've talked about here before, salvation is in three tenses. We have been saved when we trusted Christ. We are now being saved, set apart, sanctified, but someday we'll be uh, glorified in his presence where we'll be made like him. And so this is the destiny of all believers, to become like him and be crowned with glory and honor. And this is the sense he's using it right now, because he's looking down uh, the corridor of, of time and history. And so he's telling us, this is, this is what lies in, for you. Now, if you recall earlier, chapter 2, we did that about 20 years ago uh, here, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Paul, t uh, Paul, the writer of the Hebrews keeps saying Paul, tells us to pay closer attention to the things we've heard. And he talked about the danger of failing to heed. And then remember he's talking about, you know, uh, for those that didn't heed, there was a, a just reward or a just punishment, as it were. And the old covenant had that. If the old covenant, if you got, you know, uh, judged or disciplined for not following the old covenant, how much more, like he said, if you neglect so great a salvation. And so the idea here behind all this Again, the writer to the Hebrews is telling us that um, there is, you know, uh, stern consequences for those who neglect the salvation. But how he's using it here in Hebrews, it's not limited to meaning what occurs the moment we show our initial faith in Christ. He's looking at the whole big picture, including the time when we're glorified in the presence of the Lord. And it's the same instance it's used in Hebrews 9.28. Remember the very famous verse, it's appointed unto a person who wants to die after that, the judgment. Well, the next verse says, So also, after Christ was offered once uh, to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring what? Salvation when he comes back. So this is the salvation he's looking forward to when Christ comes, when our salvation is fully complete. It's funny, some writers today call it the final salvation. And I like it, you know, that's one way of explaining it. When salvation is finally complete, we're like Christ. And so he's trying to prepare believers for that. You and I are on that, on that trek for that final salvation, as it were. Now, it's, the word salvation is used many other times in that way in, in this scripture. Romans 13, 11, he says, And do this, because we know the time that it is already the hour for us to awake from sleep, for our salvation is now nearer than when we became believers. Wait a minute, how can our salvation be nearer than when we became believers when we first believed? Because he's not talking about the moment we came to Christ, he's talking about the salvation, the eventual deliverance, when we see him face to face. 1 Peter 1.5, same thing. Who by God's power protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, that's something in the future. That hadn't happened yet. So the writer of the Hebrews is doing the same thing. The salvation he's preparing his readers for is the ultimate a benefit of salvation, again, the glorification when Christ comes back at the rapture of the church and then the second coming when the rewards are given out. So inheriting salvation, like he said earlier in Hebrews 1.14, remember he talks about angels, they, they're ministering spirits, ministering to those who inherit salvation, and that's us. We're inheriting salvation, but then you get to chapter 2, verse 5, and he says this salvation that's ready to be revealed uh, in the world to come. So it, again, it's talking about a salvation in the future. So if we get that in mind, so the subject is not salvation from sin, justification by faith, you know, coming to Christ, having our sins forgiven. That's not the salvation he's referring to. It's the final tense of salvation, the glorification. And remember, uh, if we neglect so great a salvation, we're not rejecting the gospel. We're failing to properly care for the gifts God has given us so we can someday when we see him face to face, um, you know, receive that reward that we've uh, hopefully earned by being a faithful believer. So later in this letter, 
later in Hebrews, he's going to, as we saw, and that's right now, after chapter 2, he's going to clarify this, and he's clarifying it right now in chapters 5 and 6. In other words, he's telling these believers, look, you know, you guys are acting like infants, and there's going to come a day when the Lord's going to judge you, and you're going to, some of you are going to be ashamed here because you haven't matured in that, and there's no reason you cannot mature. There's no reason you cannot go forward, and you don't want to be like the land that produces, you know, the, the thorns and thistles. You don't want to be back to the Garden of Eden and, you know, with those, those uh, you know, the cursing and the burning there. You want to produce the solid fruit, and that, again, uh, the emphasis in Scripture, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, uh, Jesus talking about, by your fruits you shall know them, of, of true believers versus, versus uh, you know, false prophets and the such like. And so bottom line is, in 1 Corinthians 3, the uh, salvation will be at that day tried by fire our works to see what reward we get in his kingdom. So he's clarifying that. Now we get to verse 10, and he's going to really encourage him here now. For God is not unjust to forget your work and the love which you have showed on account of his name, having ministered to the saints and continuing to minister. All right, now he's going to say, okay, he's, he's got confidence in these people. In other words, he's beating them up a bit. Now he's building them up. He said, no, this is not referring to you. I'm confident this is not going to happen to you because and these things that accompany salvation. And then he, then he reminds them that he understands their work. In other words, he has a relationship with these people. God's not unjust to forget your work. So he's, he's sharing his confidence. Apparently, he knows these people. He has firsthand knowledge of them. So he records, reminds them of their past faithfulness. That's good. Their faithfulness is evidenced by their work and their brotherly love. They're a loving group of people. And so they began their Christian pilgrimage well, and it's important they finish well, but they've had a little bump in the middle. So if they started well, he wants them to finish well. And that's the heart of, you know, any pastor, anybody teaching the word of God. When the people come to faith, we all start well, but we want to finish well too. And sometimes in the middle, right, we kind of get a bump in the road and sometimes go in reverse. Well, that's what these people were doing, and he doesn't want that to happen. That's why this is a passionate, passionate uh, letter here. And remember, many people believe this is not just a letter, as it were, to, it's not a dry letter, but it's a sermon. We've seen that from the very beginning. He uses literary devices to get people's attention. He says certain things that would click with them. And again, as a good speaker, he's, you know, uh, chastised them to get their attention, you know, and, and maybe even the fact that, wait a minute, we're not infants, what are you talking about? And then he's talking about the possibility of falling away and, and not being able to renew yourself to repentance when you're crucifying the Lord, you know, publicly like this. And I, wait a minute, that's not us. Or hmm, maybe it could be. But he says, but I expect better things from you things that are going to accompany the salvation the day you meet the Lord face to face. And he gives the illustration, of course, of the land. Now, bottom line is the reason for his confidence in the future of the congregation is now introduced. They have a proven track record of Christian service. He knows their work in the past, something, uh, and later he's going to recall the events described in 1032 to 34 when they showed boldness in the midst of persecution. Remember the early church, they're getting persecuted left and right. Boldness in the midst of persecution. So he's shown a practical concern for these people. Uh, some had been abused, some had been in prison. And what's interesting, that we're going to learn that they cheerfully accepted the loss of their property. Cheerfully accepted the loss of their property for a testimony for Christ. Now, this is one of these ones when we get to this. Uh, I'm sure if we really think about it, this, is, this would be a real challenge for many of us. Would we be willing for the sake of Christ to give up the things here on this earth, the things that are dear to us, our property? These people were. They had to at that particular time because the Christian faith was a, you know, it's this minority religion in the Roman Empire. Christians were being persecuted. Some were losing their property rights. In fact, there was an edict in AD 303 where Christians would lose all their civil rights by the Roman Emperor Diocletian. So right now they were losing their property they're losing things it cost them something to be a Christian and yet they were still going forward he reminded them they had counted the cost and they were losing uh, being a Christian counting the cost is something we all have to do we all must do because uh, sometimes the um, the cost is 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 mind-boggling I um, I was going to share this story at the beginning but I'll, I'll share it here now you were one of the songs that you sang uh, just really really hit my heart. I love this worship group, by the way. They do such a great job. The, the song, In Christ Alone, and I'm reminded of the events uh, that happened just uh, a few weeks ago in Orlando. We had three horrific things that took place. Uh, I remember the alligator, you know, killed that little two-year-old boy at the, at the Disney Kingdom, and then, of course, the horrific slaughter 
of 49 Americans by Islamic terrorists there in Orlando, but also, too, um, Christina Grimmie, the, the singer from The Voice. Christina, um, in 2014, was, came in third place, and many of you know her. Uh, she became very famous, had millions of followers on YouTube, and the Friday night, the night before the Orlando thing happened, she was murdered by a crazed fan uh, or crazed, uh, you know, stalker, I guess you can, fan, whatever you want to call there, in Orlando. I, um, about eight or nine months ago, I went back to Marlton, New Jersey, and I was speaking there at the uh, Calvary Chapel there, and I talked to Pastor Billy, who calls himself Billy from Philly, because Philadelphia's right there, and I met his daughter, Sarah, and they asked me if I knew, heard of Christina Grimmie, and I didn't know, I'd never watched The Voice. My, my oldest daughter had known about her for years and years. In fact, she only watched this program because of the testimony of Christina. And I said, no. I said, why do you say that? Well, it says, Sarah here is Christina's best friend. They've done everything together since childhood. And they were telling me about her, you know, this is this eight or nine months ago, and how what a fabulous Christian testimony she has. And so when I heard she got shot, immediately I thought of Billy and Sarah. So I texted him late that night, and I said, you know, I'm just praying for Christina. Next morning, Billy said, nah, she's in the arms of Jesus now. And so they had the, um, the funeral the 17th of June, and uh, ABC was actually streaming it live. And I, as, it was interesting, as soon as I tu tuned in, church was packed about a thousand people there Sarah Billy's daughter was on because she was Christina's best friend and boy did that little lady preach the gospel there she went crazy with it she was just letting the people know that Christina when she was in London she'd read first Peter Christina you got to read this first Peter read it back and forth you know and they do this and it was just uh, you know the testimony that was there because very strong Bible believing Christian anyway all that to get to this Billy was talking about the funeral he said uh, he's been a lot of funerals but it's <laughs> It's going to be tough for me even saying this. When they started out, you got a thousand people in the crowd. Here's this young 20 something year old girl who just been murdered, who says fabulous testimony for Christ. They turned off, you know, all the lights and they had the video of her singing in Christ alone. And he said there wasn't a, wasn't a dry eye in the house. He said, I've been in a lot of funerals, but I never heard as much sobbing as that. But he told me a great story here too, which I thought was so wonderful. He said, the last Right before she was murdered, she, you know, they had a, their plane in Orlando. And when they finished the last song on the set, she went up to each member of the band, looked them in the eye, and thanked them, thanked them for their, uh, you know, help and thanked them for their, you know, the, the encouragement, this, that. Never done that before. And what he said, each of them testified when she looked them in the eye, it was actually like she had a halo. She was glowing. Their eyes were almost glowing. They'd never seen like this before. They didn't, you know, didn't get it at the time, but everyone looked in the eye glowing, and simply because the Lord knew he was about to, she was about to meet him. But it was such a tremendous testimony that she had and, and, and still has afterwards. But the bottom line is this. There's a sacrifice, because if she hadn't been this well-known you know, international star, that never would have happened because she wouldn't have had the fame which led a crazed fan to, to take her life. The sacrifices sometimes we make for the cause of Christ. When you're up there high profile, there's the possibility of someone wanting to be famous and take you out, and that's what happened to her. But it's, uh, you know, again, I couldn't help it when you guys sang the song. I was just thinking of Billy telling me about the funeral and her singing that on the video, and I just... Uh, I, I don't know, it just, it just really touched my heart. But the faithfulness of God and, and the sadness that's there, but sadness tinged with the fact that we know that she's better off and we'll all join her someday. But there's a cost. And the writer here is writing to people who are paying a price, who pay a cost. Some of them lost their land, lost their property. Some lost their lives. And the Lord usually doesn't ask us to lose our property or our lives for him in the same sense that other people, that most people do. But there is a cost, and the question, of course, is are we willing to pay it? These people were. Why? Because they had love for God and love for one another. And that's what he's telling them. The love is mentioned, manifested for God's name, a phrase that signifies not only simply they showed love towards others for God's sake, but also they were prompted by the love of God. It was the love of God that prompted them to love others. In other words, we love because he first loved us, right? We love because God loved us, so we, we share that love. And, and he's writing to people that, that have that love. He's reminding them how great it was at the beginning, how they were walking with the Lord, how, you know, they were strong, 
Now all of a sudden they've got this little dip in their life and he wants them to finish in the same strength that they had in the beginning because they've showed that love, they showed that, but for some reason they've hit a dry season and he wants them to go back to that motivation, that, that bold love for Christ, to serve the other members of the group, serve the saints like they had in the past. Okay, so the inspiration basically is God himself. God loved us. He gave himself for us. He's, he's the ground of our confidence, so let's move ahead. And that's what he's saying here, for the love of God and the love for others. And then in verse 11, he says, but we passionately, this is, this is, this is emotion here again, we passionately want each of you to demonstrate the same eagerness for the fulfillment of your hope until the end. So now he's really bearing his soul. And remember, this is read out loud. The first time these people heard this, they're not reading it, they're having it read to them. It's written to be listened to and also written to be read, but to listen to. So he's got motivation here, warm, affectionate tone, and you know, continues as he openly tells his listeners, his heartfelt longing for him, and his earnest desires that each one of them might continue to display the same diligence that marked them at the beginning. He says, oh, I saw you when you were young believers. Oh, I knew you at the beginning. Oh, if you only will finish the same way, but I'm detecting that you're not moving forward like you should. And so once again, he's encouraging them as a group of people to encourage one another. And he uses Christian terms to describe it. The deep concern we're to have one for another. John 13, 34, 35, on the night of his betrayal, what did Jesus say? The world will know his disciples by how the love that we have one for another. That's the mark of the Christian. So he's, he's mentioning the eagerness here, meaning something that shows great effort. And this is the same verb used in Hebrew, the noun form of the verb used in Hebrews 4.11, where Mary says, give diligence or you know, make, make it a priority, be eager to enter into God's rest. Well, he's talking about the eagerness now to fulfill the hope, uh, the fulfillment of your hope until the end. So based on the preceding chapters, the author is thinking of the confident hope that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's provided the sufficient sacrifice for them. And he, once he gets through this chapter of encouraging them to move forward, then he's gonna explain something difficult, but very important, again, the priesthood of Melchizedek, but the fact that he sacrificed us uh, once and for all. Now on the negative side here, he's already told them as a desire that they should not have a sinful, unbelieving heart. He said that a couple times, remember? Uh, in 3.12, a heart that turns away from the living God. That can happen to believers. We can do that. And, or be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In uh, 3.13, he's concerned that none of them will fall short of entering into God's blessing, entering into his rest, like the wilderness generation did because of their disobedience. So he's affirming in positive terms, this does not have to happen to you. Because remember, the Old Testament was written for our example. Uh, again, not only what we should do, but what we shouldn't do. How we should behave, how we shouldn't behave. And his heart is just breaking for these people to behave the way they started out with and to show, you know, the same diligence that you had in the beginning. In other words, demonstrate what I've already seen from you. It's, you got it in you. Don't say you don't, but let's, let's finish strong. And he says then, for the fulfillment of your hope. In other words, the full realization of the hope. And what hope is that? It's the hope of being with Christ face to face, the certainty of that, to boldly do that to the very end. And so when we go to meet the Lord one way or the other, according to this author here, he says, I hope, and he's talking to this congregation, you will be, you know, you'll all be accepted there, but also there not being ashamed, like 1 John 2, 28 says some believers will be, but you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So in verse 12 now, it's going to be the end of this thought here, because remember, 511 to verse 12, this one word puts this whole package, passage together, and he says, in that, you do not become sluggish. Remember, they were sluggish, dull of hearing. Rather, imitators of the ones who, through faith and long suffering, are heirs to the promises. All right. So here's his final exhortation before he's going to uh, give a little now explanation of Abraham. He says, all right. We don't want you to become sluggish, but we want you to imitate the ones who went before you through their faith and long suffering to persevere. So to maintain your confession of faith and to resist the testimony to be sluggish. Okay, it's the same word that we had earlier, your sluggish in hearing. Remember that in, in 511, which started this section. That's what he said. I'd love to tell you more about Melchizedek. He introduced the subject, remember, in 510, and but all of a sudden, but I can't right now because you're infants, you're kind of sluggish, you're kind of dull in your hearing. 
hearing. And uh, when you should be teachers, you need someone teaching you. So I'm trying to get you back on the, that road again. And so they must move forward and leave their spiritual sluggishness behind. By doing so, they can join the other saints who inherit the promises of God, these wonderful promises that are there for all believers if we just walk in them. So no doubt he's, again, holding forth what he said earlier in the book about regarding the ultimate salvation, entering into the greater rest in the person of Christ, and then um, receiving the rewards that are due those who, are, you know, those who have earned them. Now, the promise, of course, the problem is disobedience and unbelief may jeopardize these future promises, but faith and perseverance can help secure them. All right, so again, we ask ourselves the question, which category are we in? Are we in the ones that have been moving forward? In other words, let me ask you this way. Do you have the same diligence, the same, uh, you know, zeal, as it were, when you first became a Christian? Or are you kind of like, you know, kind of here and then kind of like down here, like sort of like a thermometer, then maybe here and here, instead of like the thermostat, you know, you get to a certain level of zeal and you continue it all along. Well, this group had shot up real quickly, but now they've kind of lost that. And he wants them to get back. And he's, he's sharing with them from the heart because he knows what the Lord has from them. That's why he puts himself, remember, let us be carried forward. He puts us in the same category as the congregation. He's not saying, well, you guys need to be carried forward like me. No, we all need to go to this together. So this is someone that's not giving this dry theological, you know, uh, uh, tutoring here. What he's doing, he's, he's from the heart saying, we need not to be sluggish, but we want to imitate those who've gone before us so we can be who are also heirs to the promise. But you guys, there's some disobedience here. There's some sluggishness here. There's some lack of concern. So I want to get you back on the straight and narrow here. And so he wants the deeper impl implications of the gospel to reflect in their lives. In other words, not to be stagnant, but to move forward. Now, the good news is this. He doesn't believe, he called them lazy, let's face it, but laziness is not permanent. We can get up and we can renew our commitment. There, so there is a warning but also with an encouragement. This is what the Lord often does. He warns the, unbelie he warns the believers, but he encourages us. Hey, look, here's where you're at right now. Let's tell it like it is. But there's encouragement here if you can renew the same earnest concern you demonstrated in the past. So instead of being lazy, let's become imitators of past examples of faith. And again, uh, that's what he's emphasizing here. This is a term that's used frequent in Paul and it introduces a topic that becomes significant in the later exhortations here. And who's that? The people who've gone before us who are great examples of faith. We have examples before each of us do. Let's imitate them. I remember um, when I was an unbeliever, when I was someone who was looking for hope, looking for an answer, looking for the, the reason for the hope was in me. I had no hope whatsoever. I, didn't, I don't know if I believed in anything, believed in God. I was a very angry, hateful young man. And uh, I actually visited a doctor because I figured something's got to be wrong with me because I got a good job. I'm making a lot of money. I got a lot of friends, but I ain't happy. So it's got to be something physically wrong with me. You know, right. I mean, come, come on. I, I, this is what's supposed to happen. This is America, right? The American dream. So I went, to a, I went to this doctor, and I said, and he said, what, what are you here for? Are you sick? He said, well, I, well, I must have something wrong with me, because I'm not happy. And I said, look, and I started going down the list, this, what all I got. You know what he said? He looked me in the eye, and he said this, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? I kid you not. I said, what? He, I said, uh, and he said, that's why you're not happy because you need to know Jesus. This Christian doctor, I mean, talk about knocking me over. Because I remember walking out of that place thinking, wow, that's the last thing I expected here. I thought he was going to give me some medication or something like that or, 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 you know, or something to get me going, to make a happy pill or something like that. Because, you know, I'm certainly not happy. I should have been. But no, it was just a real simple thing. You know Jesus. And then when I did come to know him, I understood what he was talking about. And then uh, everything else kind of fit into place, as it were. But he is a, you know, um, was a pattern that I patterned my life after a person who was boldly in the secular profession, didn't have any problem telling this young punk kid that, that he needed to know Jesus. So he, he was someone I could look at and emulate. And I've had other people in my past from, you know, day one that are examples that are, you know, to me, spiritual giants that if I become one one hundred to that person, I'll be very happy 
on the day, you know, when we stand before the Lord. And I'm sure you have them too. And God gives us these people as a reminder. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe, you know, grandparents or someone like that or uncle or aunt or someone like that who was very, very special, but something special unique about them where they stood out amongst other believers and they had something you didn't have but you really wanted and those are the people that the writer is saying we have these examples in the past to imitate imitate them now you can do that so you can be that person I don't think there's anything better than to hear from someone who knows us how we are a reflection of the love of God the love of Christ it's, you know, it's one thing for people that don't know us that maybe see us here at church or see us there and think we're great, wonderful Christians. But, you know, how do they know? They don't know us. They just see us when we're here. But for people who know you, people who are with you and can say the same thing, this is what the writer is telling these people to this community. Let's incur In fact, he's going to tell later to encourage one another, provoke one another to love and good works because I know you got it in you. It's not, you're, la you're lazy now. Let's face it. But you're not permanently lazy. And so, again, if the shoe fits, wear it. And so that's what he's saying. So he's talking, and again, the followers should imitate Christ. Remember in 2.10, Christ is the pioneer. He's the leader of our salvation. He led the way. He blazed the trail. We're to be like him. 1 John 2.6, to walk as he walked. He's the supreme example of faith, which we'll see later in chapter 10, verses 7 to 10 and 12, 1 to 3. And then later, what's interesting in chapter 13, the elders of this congregation were also people that they were to emulate the faith. Interesting. Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, we'll get to it in a few centuries probably, but uh, at the rate we're going. But it, it's an interesting passage because what he says, he says, you are to imitate those who are teaching you your leaders if they do two things. Number one, if they faithfully teach the word of God. And number two, if their lives back up their testimony. That's how you emulate them. But they have to have both, not just one. Faithfully teach the word of God, be consistent in doctrine, good teachers, and faithful and faithful to the word, but also their lives have to back it up. A lot of people got one or the other. No, you, you need them both. You need them both. And that's what he's going to eventually tell us here. But right now, he's imploring them to walk here. So such imitation means not only listening to what was said, but following the pattern of a person's life, following the pattern of a person's life. The Lord Jesus set a pattern. You have Christians probably in your life. I have them in my life who set the pattern. Wouldn't it be great if we can be a, like the pioneer, the trailblazer for others, and we set a pattern where our loved ones, our relatives, our friends say, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to be like this person. I can't think of a more wonderful thing for someone to say about you, particularly when they know you, they want to be like you. Now, uh, to do this, of course, to persevere uh, shows faithful perseverance and steadfast faith. And basically what it means is it's going to be, a, be steadfast through the good and the bad. All of us can love God when things are going good, right? Happy days are here again. Of course we love the Lord. Everything is going great and wonderful. Well, when it doesn't go great and wonderful, do we still love the Lord? Are we still, you know, thankful for everything we have? probably pray an awful lot more when things aren't going that well. But we know, some, we know this, that the Lord's there whether things are going great or things that are going not great. I remember, again, as an early Christian, as I, someone was talking to another believer, and I was listening to the conversation, and I never forgot what that person said because he was talking about faith. And he says, you know, God, you know, basically wants us to walk our walk, not by how we feel, but by what we know. In other words, some days you may not feel very spiritual. You may not feel saved, but you are saved. And again, uh, you know, you could forgive this congregation for thinking, man, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a second-class Christian now. No, no, you're in Christ, and you're, you need to move forward, but it's not how you feel this particular day. The Lord's with us whether we feel it or not. He's always with us. He's never going to leave us as he's going to tell us in chapter 13 or forsake us, even though sometimes we feel forsaken. But it's at those times... When the Lord does his greatest work, I know none of us like to hear it. I don't like to hear it, but when he does the greatest work, the greatest time is when we have to just fall on our face in front of him and ask him, Lord, I need your help. No, I desperately need your help. I need you to do something miraculous. I need you to work the kind of work that only you can do. And when we reach out to him, believe me, he comes a million miles and meets us. So this is what 
the, the author is telling these people to show that. And the models we have, of course, are biblical figures. And the one he's going to give us next, we'll see next week, is Abraham. And so we've got Abraham, you know, the, the, he's going to get to chapter 12. We're going to get Noah, Abraham, uh, the Hall of Faith, the, excuse me, chapter 11, the Hall of Faith chapter. All these people who showed their faithfulness with other biblical figures. And what I'd like you to do as you're thinking about that is, you know, fill in the gap with people you know who are faithful people in the sense. And so the faithful perseverance that's there for us. So as we end this section, the writer is basically saying this. All right. Here's what I want to do. I want to bring you further along. I want to teach you about something you need to understand. You've heard about Christ is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better, greater than Aaron. But he has a priesthood here that you need to understand what's going on. He's a high priest who understands, literally says, who can sympathize with our hurts. And so when we talk to him, it's someone who understands. How often have you ever felt like, Nobody understands me. Now, I can't explain myself to anybody. And their writer says, oh, yes, somebody does, and his name is the Lord Jesus. He understands. And as a faithful high priest, he's the one we pray to, the one who's been a human being who understands at the right hand of the throne of God. So when we talk to him about hurts, about loneliness, about this, about that, about being rejected, about being misunderstood, hey, he's been through all of those things, all of them, them some, to degrees we never would, but he can understand, he can empathize with us. And so the writer is about to start to develop that for this congregation, but first he's got to say, look, for you to understand this and appreciate it, let's move on, let's go beyond where we're at, let's move on to maturity now. Let's not be infants anymore. Let's stop doing the ABCs and the pablum and that. Let's go on for solid food. Let's be the man, the woman, the boy, the girl who is that strong Christian believer, who has that strong testimony with that same zeal, that same understanding that you first had the moment you believed in Jesus. It's possible for each and every one of us. So tonight, I just want to, again, as we uh, conclude, I want to lay out a challenge for you. Um, that may be some of us, some of us. You think about, golly, I used to be really excited for the Lord. What happened? Well, again, things do happen. But that's not the issue. The, the question is now, how are you going to finish? You know, you, you have a choice. You can finish strong or you can keep kind of being in the doldrums. It's up to us. The Lord has promised us, remember, we're going to be carried through. He's going to take us. We need to allow him to carry us to get on from this, you know, immaturity, to get on with the, from the, you know, ABCs, to get on from the, you know, the infant food, the milk, onto the solid food, the maturity, and to be able, like he said in chapter 5, to make good decisions, to discern good from evil with that mature mind and thought. But it only comes through perseverance through faith, through patterning our life after Jesus, and finding people we can pattern our life after here. Not perfect people, we're not perfect, but people who live a consistent Christian walk. And we say, I want to be like him, I want to be like her. And that's what the Lord's looking for, people who will walk that way. Because again, as the writer is saying, someday we're going to be face to face with him, and there's going to be at the final part of salvation when we're all together, there's going to be a doling out of rewards, and there's going to be rulership in the kingdom of God based upon how faithful we've been. Again, we don't understand it all, but we're told in 1 Corinthians 6, someday we're going to judge angels, judge over angels. Remember what Jesus said, a person faithful a little, I'm going to make him rule over much. One person, five towns, ten cities, this and that. So the point is simply this. Each of us has a destiny and, you know, we can't stop that from happening. But what we can do is make it a very good destiny for each and every one of us. And to be able to say, as Matthew 25, 21 says, when we get in that position, the Lord will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what the writer is trying to convey to these readers some 2,000 years ago. And the message is still the same today. We want to hear those words. We want to be, have that same zeal and enthusiasm we once had. If we're lazy tonight, it doesn't have to be permanent. The laziness can stop right now as we go forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That um, wherever we're at tonight, it doesn't have to stay that way. If, if, if there's some of us here who just aren't where we should be, we know who we are, that we, we kind of lost that enthusiasm, lost that zeal, lost that excitement, lost whatever it might be that we once had. 
and we know we lost it, and we'd like to get it back, that tonight, Lord, we can by starting to walk on the straight and narrow, by becoming that person who patterns their life after Jesus, who becomes a mature believer in Christ, who finds Christian brothers and sisters to act like, who live that sort of way, so we can be a testimony to others. And I thank you, Lord, for the people in this congregation, many that are here that are great, tremendous witnesses of Christ, whom we can pattern our lives after as they show the faithfulness of Christ, and not only in the good times, but particularly in the tough times when your grace shines through. Thank you for this wonderful letter to the Hebrews. Thank you for the exhortation that even though these people are going off on the wrong path and not being who they should be, that there is a way they can turn around, that the sluggishness is not permanent. So I pray for anyone here tonight who is sluggish, Lord, that you will turn it around and make that impermanent, make it now not sluggish, but a mature believer in the Lord Jesus. And we know it's possible because of him. Thank you for allowing that possibility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you, folks. I found the answers you need Are you listening? I'll tell you the truth about God My eyes haven't seen him These hands never 